Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 3120, Transition to Advanced Mathematics for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In this first video for lecture 24, we're going to talk about some important properties of relations. Now remember, we introduced the set theoretic definition of relations in lecture 23. And just as a quick summary here, we say that a symbol R is a relation on two sets A and B, if R is in fact a subset of their Cartesian product. And we like to think of it as like the element A relates to the element B if and only if their ordered pair belongs to the relation itself. So there's a lot of benefits from this set theoretic uh, definition of relations, some of which we're gonna see in this video as well. Now, before we get into these important properties of relations, uh, let's mention a little bit, just make sure we understand exactly what it is we're talking about here. So when we have a relation, we might say something like a generic, generically we'd say like X is related to Y, or if you want more specific examples, you might have things like five is less than seven or three is equal to seven, something like that. Now be aware that these relations are in fact statements they are either true or they're false. That's the only value that you can give to a relation here. These, these are relational expressions, I should say. The, the relation itself is a set, uh, but these with a relation, you make these expressions like the following. Five is less than seven. This is a true statement. Uh, three is equal to seven. This is a false statement. And then the original one, X is related to Y. Well, currently, this is an open statement because we don't know what x, y, or the relation r are themselves. But every statement, every, uh, excuse me, every uh, relational expression is a statement. It's either true or false. Now, on the other hand, if you were to take like an algebraic expression, as opposed to these relational expressions, you get things like three plus four, uh, you get two times nine, you get one divided by two. Um, in each of these situations over here, these aren't statements, these are quantities. They're numbers. Uh, and therefore, they could be a real number, an integer, a rational number, a complex number, depends on the number set that you have there. Now, the way that we write, them, write uh, uh, an algebraic expression is very similar to how we do a relational expression. You're going to have some number, you're going to have some symbol, and then you're going to have some other number, right? You put those together. Now, with with these algebraic expressions, your symbol is this operation. Uh, you're combining the numbers together, this operational symbol over here. And so when you combine two numbers with an operation, you get back another number. Um, on the other hand, over here, when you have your relational expressions, you connect together two quantities, uh, which honestly, any any object in mathematics, you could call it a quantity, right? I mean, what's a number after all? A number is just toys that mathematicians like to play with, right? Uh, so over here with, with, with the operations, excuse me, you connect two quantities together and you produce another quantity. Um, with relations, you connect two quantities together via the relation, um, like these ones over here, and then you don't necessarily produce the quantity back, you actually get this true-false over here. So with operations, we compute things but with relations, we prove things, which admittedly, since the value you attach to a statement is a true, false, true or false, it's a Boolean value, you can make the argument that proofs are just calculations for statements, uh, much like algebra does calculations with operations, but I somewhat digress. It's important to realize that relational expressions are statements. They're either true or false, and therefore we often have to prove things related to uh, well, relations in this situation. So in this video, what I want to do is describe some very important uh, properties that relations can have and then start to discuss how one could prove various of these uh, various properties here. Because while we could look at individual statements like 2, R, 5, um, it would be better to think of things generically. Like if I take a generic element X and a generic element Y, what can I say about the relation the relationship, the relation as a whole and not necessarily individual or pairs. Um, and so there are some very important properties of relations that I'm gonna list in this video um, that these are considered all over the place. So these are the five top properties that we're interested in when you discuss a relation. So in all of these examples, we are gonna consider relations uh, from a set back onto itself. So R is a relation on the set X here. We say that R is reflexive if for all elements x inside the set, it holds that x 
is related to x. So uh, it's reflexive if every element is related to itself. Now, it turns out the antonym of a reflexive relation is an irreflexive relation. We say that R is irreflexive if for every uh, for every element x of the set, it holds that x is not related to x. Uh, so what are some examples of reflectives, reflective and uh, reflexive and irreflexive relations here? Uh, well, for, for the, ref the reflexive relations, we have things like equality. Um, this is like the poster child of a reflexive operation, uh, relation, excuse me, because every element is equal to itself. Um, we do also have that less than or equal to is a uh, reflexive operation, uh, relation, excuse me, greater than or equal to, but admittedly that's because uh, they contain the equality relation inside of them, of course. Um, you could take set containment, uh, set containment, so a set is a subset of itself, so equality does happen, it's reflexive. Um, you have divisibility in that situation. Um, a number does divide itself. Uh, you can also take the approximate symbol. Uh, a, you know, if you're like pi is approximately pi. <laughs> that is true, right? Uh, that's a really good approximation, but generally you don't have equality, but it does allow for it. And in fact, in general, a relation will be reflexive if and only if you actually have the equality relation as a subset of that. So if the relation contains all of the equality, um, which of course what I mean in that situation is you have the relation x comma x for all x inside of x. If this is a subset of the relation, that makes it reflexive, okay? Now, in the previous video we had about relations, we did introduce this idea of a relational digraft. It's an illustration of it's an illustration of the relation itself. And this is really great when you have like a finite set. Uh, we looked at some examples of relations on sets with only five elements. We just called them one, two, three, four, five. And how do you detect uh, reflexivity on the diagram, on the digraph there? It comes down to if every vertex has a loop, then the, then the relation has to be reflexive. So for example, you look at this one right here. This is an example we considered beforehand. Notice how every element has a loop. Um, these arrows you then interpret as your relationships. So like, for example, there's an arrow between one and five because one is related to five and also five is related to one. Um, and so the arrow pointing from one back to itself suggests that one is related to one. And this arrow here says that two is related to two, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when you look at the digraph, a reflexive relation will have a loop at every single vertex. Uh, and therefore you see this one right here, this is not a reflexive uh, relation because there is not a loop at every single vertex. Uh, this actually leads to the second topic we were talking about right now. What does it mean to be irreflexive? Irreflexive means that equality never happens, basically. In other words, the an element is never related to itself. Now we've seen examples of this. Of course you have not equal to is definitely an irreflexive uh, relation. It's like the poster child of irreflective rota uh, irreflective uh, relations there. Uh, but you also get things like less than or greater than. These are also irreflexive because uh, equality is not allowed in that situation. Um, if you take the negation of the set symbol, it turns out that is also irreflexive. Now, some so this one means you're not a subset of, and since a, a set is a subset of itself, it the negation would be irreflexive. Uh, but some people also introduce this symbol right here, uh, where you take the subset symbol, but you put a line through the, the, the equal part of it, saying that you have to be a proper subset. That would also be irreflexive. Um, we could also mention that if you take not divisibility, not approximately, these are all also irreflexive things here. Um, it turns out that if you take any relation, you could always introduce its negation by putting a slash through it. Um, and it turns out that if you have a reflexive relation, its negation will always be irreflexive. So honestly, most of these symbols here um, are just the negations of the things we had above, like you have equal, not equal, you have not subset, not divide, not approximate. Um, when it comes to our inequalities here, they actually got switched around. Um, if you take the if you take the negation of less than or equal to, uh, then you're going to basically get the opposite here. Right, so those guys get switched around. So if you ever negate a reflexive uh, relation, you get an irreflexive relation. That basically gives you each and every one of them. So what about our symbol 
of elements containment inside of a set, right? Can it be a reflexive operation, uh, revelation, I should say? So if you take something like A is inside of A, this is actually forbidden um, in the axioms of set theory because we want to avoid Russell's paradox. So this never happens, which means this does happen. The not element or not in symbol is actually a reflexive relation. Uh, which then means its negation is irreflexive. So it's important to include that in that list right there. Uh, with regard to the relational digraphs, notice that irreflexivity is like the opposite of ref reflexivity. So if having a loop at every single point makes you reflexive, then the absence of a loop at every single point makes you irreflexive. So this example right here of the Pentagon is an irreflexive relation. Uh, you also have, for example, this one right here. Uh, this is an example of an irreflexive relation because there's no loops on any vertex whatsoever. Uh, this this one right here, I couldn't quite fit it above. This is an example of a reflexive relation because we can see the loops at every single spot on the list there. Um, I want to point your attention to this one here as well. Uh, so this one is neither reflexive nor is it irreflexive. It's not reflexive because we don't have loops at every single vertex. Okay, so it's not reflexive, but it's also not irreflexive because it does actually allow for loops. So notice here, it's not, uh, so, it, so it happens that two is not related to two in this example. So it's not reflexive, but we also have that three is related to three. So this reflexivity versus irreflexivity, it's not like an either or. You, If you're one, you can't be the other. Like if you're reflexive, you can't be irreflexive. And if you're irreflexive, then you, you can't be reflexive. Those are gonna be opposites of each other. I should mention there is one example of a relation which is both reflexive and irreflexive. And this is basically the only one there is. You take X yourself itself to be the empty set, which means the only relation on the empty set is the empty set itself. This is an example of a reflexive and irreflexive uh, relation. It's the only such one. Because to be reflexive, you have to take every element of inside of X and it has to be related to itself. But since X doesn't have any elements, it's the empty set, this condition is vacuously true for the empty relation. But for irreflexivity, it works the other way around too, that for all elements, you can't be related to each other. So if there's nothing, then it's then it's not not related to each other. So you're good, right? Um, so you, this is an example of something being vacuously true in that situation. Because to be reflexive, or let's say, if, let's say you're trying to show like, oh, is it reflexive or not? Well, if it weren't reflexive, that means there has to be an element not related to itself. No such element exists because it's the empty set, so it's reflexive. Uh, for irreflexivity, in that situation, to be not irreflexive, there have to be an element for which is related to itself. No such element exists, so this is an irreflexive relation. So this is the only one that there that there's possible here. Now, when we were discussing uh, when we were discussing the reflexive property and the irreflexive property previously, I introduced the notion of a negation of a relation. Um, we, we we did that, of course, in the previous lecture, but we made it a little bit more formal. I put the definition on the screen there. Um, although I didn't really draw attention to it because we've already really talked about it. Given any relation, there is its negation, okay? Uh, so the relation there has the condition that um, A is related to B if and only if A comma B is inside the set. Well, what does it mean for A to be not related to B? That actually would mean that A comma B is not in R. In other words, the negation, the negation of a relation is just, of course, the complement of R when you view it as a subset of A cross B. So given any relation, we can define a new relation, its negation. Um, another important relation that we can construct from a given relation is its inverse. So if R is a relation from A to B, then the inverse of A, which is denoted as R to the negative one superscript, this is gonna be a relation from B to A. So notice the direction switches around. That is um, R inverse is a subset of B cross A. And this is the relation such that you have the element b comma a exactly when a comma b is an element of r. So in other words, we have that b is re related by the inverse to a if and only if a is related to b. That's the relationship there. This happens if and only if, of course, um, a comma b is inside of r. 
So we have this inverse relation as well. And then of course you can take the negation of the inverse. You can combine those together if you want to. Uh, we weren't gonna talk about that one so much, but the inverse is an important relation. Uh, in particular, when A equals B, um, all four of these things are relations on the exact same set. So R is a relation on A, um, the negation is a relation on A, the inverse is a relation on A, and the negation of the inverse is a relation on A. We mentioned when we talked to uh, talked about reflexivity that there's a relationship between the properties of between a, a reflective relation and its negation, which necessarily has to be irreflective. So one property of one can influence the property of another. Um, and this is why we want to introduce this inverse property, because for the, the next one, the, the, the next property we're going to talk about, uh, which is known as symmetry, turns out there's a relationship between uh, the inverse of a relation and the relation itself when symmetry gets involved there. So what is symmetry here? So we say that R, the relation R, is symmetric if for all points X and Y inside the set X, if X is related to Y, then Y is related to X. There's a the opposite of symmetry here is what we call anti-symmetry, which is a little bit different than the irreflexivity we saw before. Anti-symmetry actually means that if you have elements X and Y, and if it holds that X is related to Y and Y is related to X, then it must have been the case that X equals Y. So basically for symmetry, if you have a relation in one direction, you have you have a relation in the other direction. For anti-symmetry, that never happens with the exception of equality. So some examples of symmetric relations that we have introduced previously. So equality is a symmetric relation. So th if three equals two, then two equals three, um, which of course I know that's not true, but if you had like X equals three, then three equals X, then sure that could be true. Um, that kind of led me to my next one, non-equality. Uh, in this case, if you're not equal, that is a symmetric relation. I'll say that one, two is not equal to three, that implies three is not equal to two. It's a symmetric relationship. Uh, approximately equal to um, is symmetric, not approximately equal to. Turns out there's a connection between symmetry of a relation with the symmetry of its negation. Notice these are negations of each other and they're both symmetric. We'll see in just a second that for every symmetric relation, its inverse, excuse me, its, its negation is also symmetric. Okay, now when it comes to a relational digraph, how do you see symmetry? Symmetry is parent uh, when it's present when you can see arrows going in both directions. So every arrow is reversible. So when you look at this example here, the arrows only go in one direction. You can't turn it around. So this is not a symmetric relation. Um, you look at this next one right here, same thing. The arrows only go in one direction. It's not symmetric. Uh, but if we look at this, third option here, this one, um, you'll notice that every time there's an arrow, it's a double arrow. So this is an example of a symmetric relationship here. Uh, we'll look at some more examples in just a moment. Uh, let's then talk about anti-symmetry, the sort of the opposite notion of symmetry. Uh, so you're anti-symmetric that if whenever you have a relationship going in both directions, so whenever you have a double arrow, it turns out it actually was a loop. Um, that is only equality. Uh, is the only way you can be symmetric in that situation. So examples of relations that we've seen before that are anti-symmetric, less than um, is an anti-symmetric relationship here. Uh, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. Now I should mention that these are all anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetry doesn't say that you have to be reflexive. It just, anti-symmetry says that if you have symmetry, it only happens when you're equality. Um, equality is not required. So equality is allowed here, but equality is forbidden here. But altogether, these are anti-symmetric because they're in for this one and for this one, there's never a case where you have um, A is less than B and B is less than A. That never happens. Um, less than or equal to is possible, but never for less than or greater than. Okay, so those are um, anti-symmetric relationships. Of course, there is the set containment symbol. That's going to be anti-symmetric. And so if you look at the examples we've seen so far, I kind of already suggested this, that for an anti-symmetry um, digraph, it'll be anti-symmetric if there's never bi-directional arrows. The arrows never go in two directions. Loops, uh, that's okay. A loop is okay. You don't have to have loops, though. Uh, so when we look at these ones again, so this example... Um, is an example of a anti-symmetric 
uh, digraph here. The relation is anti-symmetrical because the arrows never go in two directions. The only potential situation is a loop, but loops don't count against anti-symmetry. This one is also anti-symmetric because the arrows never go in two directions. Uh, this one, like we already mentioned, is in fact not anti-symmetric uh, because they do have direction, the arrows going in two directions. This one is an anti-symmetric diagram. Uh, because again, the arrows only, they never go in two directions. And then lastly, this one right here, um, this is an example of one that is neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. It's not symmetric uh, because there do exist arrows that go in only one direction, such as one is related to two, but two is not related to one. OK, uh, but it's also not an anti-symmetric one because you do have bi directions here. Uh, you do have that two is related to five and five is related to two. So not a not a anti-symmetric diagram, not a symmetric one. So you can have di you can have relations which are symmetric. You can have relations which are anti-symmetric. Um, you can have relations that are neither symmetric nor anti-symmetric. Can you have relations that are both? symmetric and anti-symmetric. Uh, so we consider that for reflexive and irreflexive di uh, relations there, um, for which I said only the empty relation can do that. Well, if you take the equality relation, so x, the only things related to each other are x and x, them, uh, x is related to x, that's it. So if you take the equality relation, which again, this is a subset of x cross x, uh, if you take any relation that's a subset of that, um, this is gonna be both symmetric and it's going to be anti-symmetric. And it turns out you can show that the only symmetric, anti-symmetric um, relations are going to be exactly those which are subsets of equality. Now, I alluded to this fact earlier, and I, just, I wanted to make it explicit now. Um, with regard to a relation, if it's symmetric, and then it says we, we can actually say something about its, its negation. If a relation is symmetric, then its negation is also symmetric. This is what I meant earlier, that the properties of one relation can influence the properties of its relatives. Uh, so, for example, the negation is also going to be symmetric. How does one prove symmetry? So, symmetry is itself a conditional statement, um, which is universally quantified. So, for all elements x and y, if x is related to y, then y is also related to x. So we want to prove that universal conditional statement there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take two generic elements, x and y, and suppose that the relation satisfied. Now, I'm not talking about the relation r, I'm talking about the relation not r. So let's suppose that x is not related to y. Now, I need to then prove that this implies that y is not related to x. I'm going to prove this by contradiction. So I'm going to take the conclusion I want and I'm going to negate it. So the negation of y is not related to x is that y is related to x. So suppose to the contrary that y is not related to x. Now, if y is related to x, sorry, suppose to the contrary that y is not not related to x. So y is related to x. Well, this is, this is now involving the original relation R, which is a symmetric relation. So if Y is related to X, that's what we're assuming, that means that X is related to Y. But that then contradicts our original one there. We get a contradiction, so we get the opposite of what we assumed. So therefore, this is now false. We get that Y is not related to X, which is then just this one turned around. So that actually tells us that the negation is a symmetric relation. So if a relation is symmetric, it's Negation is also symmetric. This is why, since equality is symmetric, not equals is also symmetric. Uh, approximately, we said, was symmetric, which means not approximately is also symmetric. Okay? Um, now, we introduced this inverse, right? How are they related? Well, it turns out that a relation is symmetric if and only if um, it's, it's, it's equal to its inverse. So the inverse reverses the order of things. Well, if you reverse all of the order pairs and you get back the exact same thing, that's exactly what it means for a relation to be symmetric. So, so far we've introduced reflexive and then its opposite irreflexive. We've introduced symmetric and its opposite anti-symmetric. There's one last property of relations we want to introduce in this video. And this is what we call a transitive uh, relation. We don't have a opposite notion of transitivity. At least we're not going to introduce one in this video here. Again, if R is a relation on X, we say that R is transitive if 
for all elements x, y, and z inside of the set x, whenever x is related to y and y is related to z, it holds that x is related to z. And so let's see some examples of transitive relations. Well, equality is a transitive relation. Um, less than is transitive, greater than is transitive, less than or equal to is transitive, greater than or equal to is transitive. What else? We have set containment. It is transitive. We have divisibility. That is a transitive relation. Um, I want to come back to this divisibility one for just a second. Uh, I, actually, I want to focus on this one for a second, but actually because with regard to symmetry, there's something important to mention here. Is this a symmetric relationship? Right? Well, it depends on the set that you're considering, right? If you think of divisibility equipped with the integers, right? So if you take integers with divisibility, um, it turns out this is not symmetric. Well, I mean, it's not symmetric. You actually never get symmetry here. I meant to say anti-symmetry. It's not anti-symmetric. Um, it's not symmetric because like um, two divides four, but four doesn't divide two. So it's not symmetric, but it, but is it anti-symmetric? It's also not anti-symmetric because you get two divides negative two. Um, you get that negative two divides two, but you don't have that two equals negative two. So with regard to the integers, divisibility is not anti-symmetric. It's not symmetric. But if you change the set to the natural numbers, so you look at the natural numbers with respect to divisibility, um, it's still not symmetric, but it is now anti-symmetric. In that situation, if A divides B and if B divides A, then we actually have that A equals B. And for this reason, because divisibility is anti-symmetric when we restrict ourselves to the, pos uh, to the positive integers and zero, uh, this is oftentimes why when we talk about divisibility, we restrict our attention to natural numbers or just positive numbers if we don't want to include zero either. Because we want anti-symmetry for this relation. We just haven't introduced those terms yet. So divisibility is an anti-symmetric relation when you're on the natural numbers, but not with the integers. So the set in play does matter. It makes a big difference there. Um, I should also mention with regard to this symbol, um, not that sim. I don't want to make it, you think of that it's, it's transitive there, but with regard to symmetry, right? Is it possible that A is an element of B and B is an element of A? For sets, again, we don't, we don't allow this thing to happen. No, 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 no. Um, in which case this, you cannot have A as an element of B and B as an element of, of A. So that never happens with, with sets whatsoever. And therefore that actually makes this set symbol, uh, this actually makes it anti-symmetric because the hypothesis of the conditional never is satisfied. It's actually vacuously true that this is an anti-symmetric uh, property there. It's not, a, it's not symmetric though, for sure. So those are some things I should have said on the previous slide. Anyways, let's get back to transitivity. If whenever R is related to Y and Y is related to Z, it must also hold that X is related to Z. So equality, less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, set containment, divisibility. These are all examples of transitive relations that we have seen previously in our lecture series. Uh, with regard to the relational digraph, you'll notice that a, a relation is transitive if whenever there's a path from one point to another point, that actually implies there's a direct arrow. So look at this graph right here. Uh, re which represents a relation. There is a path from, say, 5 to 1. Notice you can take this path from 5 to 1. Since there's a direct path, that's a good sign there. Um, there is a path from, say, 5 to 2, but there's also a direct path in that situation. Um, and so a graph is transitive exactly when there's always a direct link whenever a path exists. So this is a transitive relation. This is also a transitive relation. Uh, when you look at this one, this one is also transitive. Uh, whenever, whenever two points are connected, there is a link that actually connects both of them there. Um, let's look at a few other ones. This is an example of a transitive relation. Again, whenever there is a connection between two um, points, there's always a direct path between them. Um, is this one transitive? Okay, you'll notice that four is all by itself. Um, so it's disconnected from the rest of the group. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. To be transitive, what has to happen is that if there is a connection, there's a direct connection, okay? So notice in this situation that there is a path from one to five, 
but there is no direct path here. So this is an example of a non-transitive relation. So it is possible for relations to be non-transitive. All right, some other ones I should talk about. Let's talk about like approximately. Um, it's approximately a transitive relation. Well, what does approximately actually mean? If two numbers are approximately equal to each other, it means they're close to each other. Um, and so you can have it like, oh, here's a number x1 that's that's approximately x2. You can have a number that's like x2 that's approximately x3. You can have a number that's approximately x3 that's approximately x4. But the thing is, approximately doesn't mean like, it just means they're close to each other. So if, if, if one and two are close and two and three are close and three and four are close, eventually there could reach a point where you have like somewhere down this sequence, you have like x in minus one is approximately x in, but you have that x1 is not approximately equal to x in. Like, because thing is like, this is means they're close and these are close. But when you put them together, even though like, x2 is close to 1 and close to 3, it could be that x1 and x3 are not close enough to be considered approximate, right? Um, and so approximately, honestly, the approximate relation is not really well defined. Uh, what does it mean? Like, wh why is pi approximately 3.14? Like, what does that actually mean? It's, it's a little ill-defined, but if you take that idea of closeness, we can make this rigorous and calculus talking about epsilon delta. Uh, but there could be a point that just because these two are close and these two are close, it doesn't mean that these two are close to each other, okay? So this approximate symbol is, it's, it's symmetric, it's reflexive, but it's not transitive, okay? Um, and so these, these topics we're introducing, it's important to realize they all offer something new, that you can have a relation that's not transitive but is symmetric reflexive. You can have something that's reflexive and transitive but not symmetric, um, like less than is such an example. It's, uh, it's less than or equal to. It's reflexive, but transitive, but not symmetric. It's actually anti-symmetric. Uh, but you could take equal, for example. Equal is reflexive and transitive, but not anti-symmetric. It's actually symmetric in that situation. So you can construct examples of relations that satisfy some of these conditions, but not all of the conditions, which is why we've introduced all five of them. Um, I also want to mention that this symbol, this set element, is also an example of a non-transitive relation. So you could have things like A is inside of B and B is inside of um, C, but we definitely should not have that A is inside of C. That'd be kind of weird. Maybe, maybe not, it depends. Um, it actually can happen sometimes, but let me show you it's not transitive. Let's take, for example, uh, we'll take the set A to be the set that contains the natural numbers, the integers, and the rational numbers, something like this. And so notice that zero is an element of the natural numbers. And the natural numbers is an element of A, but we have that zero is not an element of A. So again, this shows that it's not transitive. And so these five properties are going to be properties of relations we explore in the future. They're all independent of each other. A relation can have some of the properties, but not other ones. Um, and they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. There are some times where even opposite looking properties can be um, cohabitating. Like you can be reflexive and irreflexive in one special case. You can be symmetric and anti-symmetric in some special cases and such. Um, definitely, you can have some of these properties together. And we're going to talk about relations in the future that have some of these properties and then develop the theories around those.